Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. It's Sunday, February 19th, 2023. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. Welcome to Cubs Out Loud, the Bear Podcast of Indetermined Length, episode number 684. And this has been the most I've talked since Friday when certain things happened, and now I have a little bit of a whistle in my voice. That's okay. You sound <laughs> just fine. Yeah. Anyways, we've got Dr. Edward Angelina Cook with us today. Yay! Yay! I, got a, I got a big... Uh... <laughs> so I had to give him a standing now. Um, yeah, I don't have any transition. Gary, what are we talking about today? <laughs> Well, of course, because Edward is back, it's most likely a Landscape of Relationships series episode. And uh, this time, we're going to talk about uh, being connected, I think is one way to look at it. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. here's something to think about. Have you ever heard someone uh, either classify themselves or another person as being clingy? Codependent, needy, dramatic, closed off, emotionally unavailable, and allergic to drama, or that they have quote unquote attachment issues. So, according to Dr. Angelini Cook, this is way more common than you think it is. Hence, we're going to do an episode about attachment. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, mm-hmm. It it is very common. This is actually something that I I talk about probably the most um, in my practice with others, um, and approximately about forty percent of people have um, what is uh, called an insecure attachment of some form. Okay, that's a lot of people. It is. I'm a little curious as to what the difference might be between a secure attachment and an insecure attachment, but we might get to that in the midst of this. So, yeah. So let's take a trip back into the way back machine. Um, so, uh, as far as like research goes, there are two um, big names when we talk about like attachment theory um, John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth. Um, and, uh, they, a lot of their work, um, focuses on, um, attachment as basically like a permanent psychological connection between human beings. Um, and basically like we are born to have emotional, to create emotional bonds with our caregivers. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea is that attachments that we have with our caregivers, um, we're more likely to receive comfort and protection and survive into adulthood from like a, um, an evolutionary standpoint. Um, and also that primary caregivers give this like sense of security, um, as the central theme, uh, within attachment theory. So Mary Ainsworth though, um, took this and she created this study called the strange situation study where she, um, had uh, mother and uh, child dyads, and she would leave the child in a um, a room, and the mother would leave, um, and then you know the the baby would behave in a specific manner, and based on that, um, she you know uh, came up with these patterns or these uh, attachment styles 
Um, so like secure attachment, um, that is like where uh, the uh, the child was able to, you know, like have a, you know, a typical response when their caregiver lives in a room, but is able to kind of self-regulate themselves. Um, ambivalent or insecure attachment, that is where, um, you know, they like really freaked out um, when the caregiver left the room. And even when the caregiver came back, they were um, really hard to like calm down. And then you have um, avoidant insecure attachment, which is where when the caregiver came back into the room, um, they were fine. Um, it looked like they were okay, but they were just kind of like masking their response because they um, probably got a, a response that it wasn't okay to cry. Um, and mm -hmm. then um, later, um, one of uh, Mary Ainsworth's doctoral students um, added a disorganized um, insecure attachment, which is um, kind of like both where um, they were uh, anxious, um, but then also avoidant about, uh, you know, creating or maintain, you know, they were fearful of their caregiver. Um, mm. So, uh, you know, then, then there's also research that these, um, or the theory is that uh, the attachment patterns that we have uh, as children will maintain into adulthood. Um, so if we have insecure attachments with our caregivers, then we will likely have insecure attachments with others as adults. Okay. And I, I think that I'm hoping most individuals can understand that basically what occurs in childhood imprints on you and has potentially lifelong impacts. So if you feel that you're abandoned or uh, unloved or whatever you want to describe it as, that that would carry forward as a potential so that you may, you know, be doubtful of relationships or happiness or contentment, whatever those are, because you didn't necessarily experience them before. Mm -hmm. um, and when we get to be adults, um, you know, because we're adults, right? So like some common traits of these insecure um, patterns are like for people who are anxious, insecure, um, they will be responsive to, to, towards their partner's needs, um, but feel insecure about their own worth in the relationship. Um, they will also, uh, if they... Uh, fear, sense, um, or uh, what word do I want to use? Um, predict a, a, sense, a, a rejection from somebody else. They will blame themselves. Um, and then um, they also require a lot of uh, reassurance of their own worth and their own love um, mm. from, from others. Um, and people who are avoidant, um, they are usually very independent, social, have high self-esteem. So, like, you know, sometimes we think of people who are avoidant as not being very social. But, like, when it comes to um, this pattern, a lot of them are really social and seem like they have their act together. Um, the, but the, the difference is that a lot of their social interactions and relationships remain on the surface. So they don't really go um, deep. And they also avoid strong displays of closeness and intimacy. Um, and they feel like they don't really need emotional intimacy. You have a face. <laughs> Keep going. I, I'm following along. <laughs> All right. So when we talk about disorganized um, insecure attachment, that is um, some, some common commonalities of that are um, they are perpetually waiting to be rejected, disappoint, disappointed and hurt from somebody. Um, they really want to be close and they really want that intimacy with others, but they are absolutely afraid of it. Um, and they kind of see this, uh, then it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy because they will get into relationships and they will... Um, you know, be really wanting this, but in the back of their head, they're like 
waiting for the rejection. They're waiting to be uh, disappointed, um, which then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because they will look for things as potential threats to the relationship. And then they will like, it will, you know, sometimes either they will leave the relationship or um, it will end because of their perceived um, anxiety about uh, the future of the relationship. Um, but a secure relationship that is, um, or somebody who has like a, a secure attachment, um, that is somebody who is able to identify and regulate their emotions within a relationship. Um, they are strong, uh, goal oriented, uh, goal oriented behavior in a relationship. Um, and they're able to bond and trust well with others. Hmm. So when you were going through the the traits of the insecure attachments, I was like, wow, okay, let's just call some people out, shall we? Uh, <laughs> I was just like, damn, okay. Mm -hmm. And just remember, right, when it comes to um, uh, insecure attachment styles that, you know, approximately 40% of people um, have some one of these um, insecure patterns. So that's that's a lot. <laughs> um, and um, you know, so if you if you know if you do feel called out, know that you're in good company. <laughs> it's an interesting way to try to put a silver lining on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you might feel and... bad, but you're not alone in feeling bad. <laughs> Right. Um, so, Gary, you were going to say something? Well, I was just, I, I find it interesting um, to be thinking over these, you know, examples, the anxious, the avoidant, and the disorganized. Um, I've witnessed all of them. I've probably been all of them at some point or another. Um, so I find that really intriguing to, to think about that stuff in terms of like the rejection and and the the prophecy kind of self-fulfillment aspects and like um avoidance tactics uh you know that um we do what we think is in our best interest it just may not actually be so and i i try explaining that to people when they don't understand why some people have you know a certain habit or behavior um, you know, in the work that I do, I find um, it's a struggle for some folks who, while they also kind of work in the field, they they have difficulty in detaching judgment because they think, um, why would this person, you know, behave in such a fashion that puts them at harm or exposes them potentially to harm? And I try to explain to them that that is not what's happening in their mind at the moment that these behaviors are being exhibited. If, you know, I try to explain to them, I was like, if you think of it, and this isn't always the case, but I use this as an example. I'm like, if you think of it through a lens of addiction, how individuals do not have the capacity potentially to not do whatever this thing is because they don't have the tools, they're unaware, their um, physical system is overloaded be it hormones or thought processes, whatever that may be, you know, it, it's, if you think of it from that standpoint, I think it's easier or you have a moment that you can be more compassionate towards the individual because you realize, um, as sometimes the saying goes, you don't know what you don't know. And so if you don't know that there's a different way to do something, then why would you ever do that? It's like, you know, I, I think of it this way. I see a lot of this stuff about like food trends and like social media, especially like TikTok and and all these things. And they're like, oh, did you know that you could do this instead of this? Um, and I find it interesting because there's a part of me that's like, well, I think there's probably a kernel of truth in that. Um, unfortunately, there's way too many misleading things uh, because people don't necessarily understand like uh, chemistry and how that is a big play in the way food can be manipulated and turned into something different. And mm -hmm. so they get upset and they're kind of then they're upset and they're like, well, this thing didn't work. And it's like, well, right, because that was clickbait. Like that was to get your attention. It wasn't technically trying to teach you something. It was, you know, misguided. Um, 
And so you get disappointed by trying something different. And I think that happens in all of our lives. Like we try something a little different. And then if it doesn't work out, I think our capacity, unfortunately, in today's modern age is to just simply write it off and be like, oh, well, that didn't work. So obviously, it, like it's bad or it's faulty or whatever. And it's like, no, like just because you tried to make bread and it didn't really turn out doesn't mean you can never make bread. You may have to try again. You may have, you know, it may take more than one time to get it right, you know. And mm -hmm. nobody, nobody is perfect at anything right out the gate. There, there are potential diamonds in the rough um, that people have an innate ability to do something. But even then, they're probably not perfect. They're just really good or have a skill level that most people don't. So they have an advantage if you want to think of it even in such a term. Or that that behavior is modeled for them at a really young age, um, so it's it's more um, close to them, more proximate to them for them to access it. Uh, sometimes we don't even know that we're doing it. And I think that's one of the things that parents, with um, time and space, I think that's something that parents probably struggle with, is looking back and recognizing like. I did what I could at the time and I and maybe they sometimes kind of beat themselves up and feel like they failed as parents because they could have done better. But it's like, could you really like if you didn't know how, how would that have been possible? And I know for my parents, specifically with my father, he said many times to me, not, you know, too many times, but he he really hit home when he gave me this understanding that, like, listen, he's like your mother and I, we just do the best that we can. Like no one's given us a book on how to raise a kid. So we might screw up some things. Mm -hmm. And he said that to me when I was young, like, like not maybe probably when I was going to be like a teen, like he just wanted me to understand that they both loved me and they cared about me, but they also probably fucked up. And I really appreciate that because I think that takes a huge amount of humanity to like kind of open yourself up that way, especially to someone that you helped raise <laughs> to say, I ain't perfect. The world ain't perfect. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry in advance. <laughs> or something along those lines. And a lot of these uh, patterns are intergenerational. So, like, we will develop, you know, if we have a parent who is anxious, like, who has an anxious attachment, sometimes we'll develop an anxious attachment or sometimes we'll, we'll develop an avoidant um, attachment, right? Because... Um, we, you know, a lot of these are based around safety and um, comfort, right? Like if we don't feel safe and comforted um, kind of growing up, you know, we're going to replicate that. Well, and, and that's just a universal level of experience, right? Like just being a human being. And then you add other things to that. Um, as I talk about not frequently, but I find every once in a blue moon with work, I, I talk about otherness and I explain to my coworkers, if you have been othered in your life, I think you are much more able to have a moment of compassion or to recognize it happening to other people. And if that hasn't happened for you, it is not as, uh, apparent mm -hmm. or easy, I guess. Um, if you, cause you, I don't know how to explain it. Like I, I'm, I tried telling people, I was like, I don't know what it's like to be a person of color. I don't know what it's like to be discriminated against because of who I am by the color of my skin. I do know what it's like to be hated for who I am. And that's not the same thing, but it makes me aware. And so when the reason I'm bringing this up is I think now all of this gets more complicated because you have of the root level of just the human experience and the challenges of being raised. And then there can be other things on top of it that something that in most cases are not something you can control. Right. And that's a really wonderful segue into the idea that for um, gay men and other queer individuals, um, you know, their socio-sexual identity development from childhood to adulthood um, might have an impact on their attachment style. Um, and that's um, based on the, uh, there's like a, uh, an attachment model called the proto prototype model of attachment, like how we, how we, how our attachment styles may 
stay the same, how they might change. Um, and for queer individuals, um, you know, not only is it attachment that's going on, but it's also minority stress. Um, so when, even if you have a secure caregiver support and you have a, a secure attachment growing up, um, you know, you might uh, be rejected by your peers later. And having that secure um, attachment growing up will help you main, kind of maintain that secure attachment into adulthood. But having a previously secure um, attachment style with a caregiver, and then they reject you um, during the, the coming out process, will have the potential to transition to an insecure attachment style in adulthood. Um, and then also take that a step further, if we have a secure peer support, um, after we have say an insecure childhood, um, that will have the potential to transition towards a secure attachment in adulthood. Um, but if we have a insecure attachment with the caregiver growing up, um, we're gonna likely experience certain things like um, shame, internalized homophobia, uh, internalized transphobia, um, uh, internalized racism, right? Um, and that will also impact our disclosure towards those who are closest to us, like our family. <clears throat> and in some populations, it could create this expectation that they're always going to be rejected. I think it's interesting that you say that because what I see out of it is like these these variables of experience. So like you were saying, if you have a secure care, caregiver, um, like that predicts one potential outcome. If you have an insecure caregiver, that also predicts a different potential thing. Or if it flips, like they are secure and then they become insecure because they reject you or they judge you or they pull away from you um, and, and kind of what those things are. And I've, I've seen that in my own life, witnessed it. And I battled with it when I was younger because I saw with even within my own family that there is an adult who has offspring and they are not equipped to meet the needs of their offspring. Mm -hmm. And I realize it probably sounds pretty judgmental, but from an outside perspective, that was what I was witnessing. And for a brief time, I wanted to be the one to fix that because I had been in the experience of having some things not be what I needed them to be. And then I realized that I, this is, this is one, this is not my direct family. Like, and also it is not my responsibility to do that. Um, and yet you still witness that and how that like has an impact on you. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I work with a lot of trans, uh, like a lot of trans clients, right? And like one of the things that I am uh, like really telling them, um, and it's, you know, there's research to support this, that having a support network as a, uh, as a trans youth will greatly um, impact their chances, their protective factors into adulthood. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the same goes for literally so many others. Um, but, you know, we, just because we don't come from a, um, a supportive, um, you know, uh, upbringing does not mean that we can't find that support um, into adulthood. Um, it's just going to, you know, that's where the resilience comes in. And we have to, sometimes we have to find it. Mm-hmm. That's fair. Yeah, and that's where I come in. You help people. I do. It's, uh, I really, really love my job. Yay. Yeah. Um, so, so that makes sense, right? The idea like how, um, you know, so we're talking about a lot of the research on attachment says that like, if we have an insecure attachment, 
uh, you know, from infancy, right, or like early childhood, that that's going to have an impact into adulthood. But, you know, we're also saying that there are other factors that could impact um, that style into adulthood, right? So like, you know, uh, here's sexual identity development, but like also we could talk about like trauma. Um, there are a lot of different factors that could impact your attachment style into adulthood. Um, you know, so you could have a secure upbringing um, and that doesn't always necessarily mean that that's going to carry with you into adulthood based on factors of your life. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk about the bear community, shall we? Mm. right so um here we're talking about two stigmatized i two stigmatized identities right fatness and queerness and um you know i know that there are, i hear so many narratives of bears who initially come out and and try to integrate themselves with into the the overall gay community um and they feel rejected um and, you know, unfortunately, there are some people who retreat um, and they don't try to engage again. Um, uh, but then there are others, right? Like, I think everybody here, right, that uh, we found another um, community, uh, the bear community that helped transition us or could potentially help transition us to a more secure attachment. Okay. I'm kind of thinking there might be a third um, in terms of stigmatizing about femininity um, or not being as masculine. And the reason I say that is because I think there is a presumption from an outside perspective that the LGBTQ plus community is welcoming of everyone. But as we very well know, even within our own rank and file, we have issues that yep. we need to work on. And so I think the bear community has a tendency to want to adopt certain things. And this was huge in the nineties going forward. And I think it's been diminishing over time, this concept of the hyper-masculine and eschewing the femininity. Um, mm -hmm. And now more than ever, we see that, you know, you're just being you. So you're big, you're proud, you're hairy, you're not hairy, you're feminine, you're not feminine. Like, you know, you paint your nails, but you have a full beard, you know, like I see a lot of that kind of stuff blending, but that also is because individuals ha are finding their authentic selves. Yep. Um, and also, you know, we, uh, I think we would be remiss if we didn't bring the topic of race and ethnicity into this, um, discussion as well. Right. That is another mm -hmm. big topic within, um, the, the bear community. Right. And even, um, gender, right. Um, so, you know, again, another opportunity where we need to say that, you know, us as a community need to be more inclusive um, and provide opportunities to help people transition to a more secure attachment, give them those opportunities that they really, really want and they are craving and they are desiring. Right. Yeah. I think it's fair. Um, so... So that's just one part of the process, um, and that's all well, well, well and good. But this is a two-step process. So we're talking about like inter um, interpersonal relationships, but the other part of this is intrapersonal um, relationships, like the relationship that you have with yourself. Um, because a lot of times, um, I find people they understand that they have attachment to help manage their um, their attachment issues when. Sorry, no. It's our responsibility to kind of know and manage our own attachment style, right? Because that can help help us transition into a more secure attachment. Um, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, I mean, it, it goes to you know some of the sayings that have been made. It's like if you don't know who you are, then how can you know the world? Um, you know, if you don't love yourself, how can you love other people? And it's, and it is about like having sense of self versus, um, sense of the world or being able to represent yourself within the broader world, I guess. Yeah. And every, um, every journey starts with a single step, right? So like 
you know, we don't have to like, you know, it's just about self-awareness, right? Like I don't wake up every morning and I'm like, I'm fucking love myself, <laughs> right? Like sometimes I don't feel good about myself and it's about understanding that and, and um, knowing what I can do about it and what I need from others to help me with that. Mm-hmm. Um. But I have found that mindfulness has been a really helpful uh, practice in that because it helps me kind of learn um, and practice, um, you know, my locus of control, right? What I have control over, what I don't have control over, what is um, available to me right now, right here. Um, and that a lot of times the stories, the narratives that I'm telling myself um, are ghosts from the past, right? And they are they are not necessarily representative of the present and here and now. Um, so, you know, it helps me also practice this concept of like differentiation of self um, that like, I am not my partner, right? And my partner is not me. I, I am my own person and I have my own autonomy and I can make choices um, for myself that are, going to lead me to the best version of myself that I can possibly be. Yeah. I, I think um, it, it's interesting as you were saying that, because I think that is about like knowing, like taking time for space and understanding what that can provide you. Mm-hmm. Um, like one of my coworkers and I were just recently talking about, they were mentioning um, about how they, as they've gotten older, they've gotten into meditating. And I talked about, like I said, I've done it many times throughout my life. I just don't do it with frequency. But I find more often than not, I'm more open to moments in my life as I'm aging that these are, this is a moment I need to do that. Or I should step back or step out from the situation and not be so focused on what I'm experiencing and think things in a, in a different light. Yep. Um... I'm a really big one on like narratives and like, you know, these stories that we tell ourselves and, you know, sometimes I can see a situation as like a horror movie. Um, But if I kind of take, take a moment, ground myself, right. Then I can realize that like, no, that's, I'm just kind of replaying a memory or, something from my childhood or my adolescence. um, That is, that's what's showing up for me. Not, Mm -hmm not what's here now. Right. Um, and I think also we need to be kind to ourselves. Um, and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the times we are looking for acceptance from other people. We're looking for love from other people. We're looking for, um, you know, a lot of these things, which is great. Um, and wonderful, but you know, I think that I would encourage people to, um, see if they can provide that for themselves um, and, sh- and provide compassion for themselves. So like something that I will, um, tell people is if your best friend was here with us right now, um, and they were going through what you're t- kind of telling me right now, what would you tell them? Mm. And those are the things that we need to, to tell ourselves, right? Like you're strong, you got this, you know, I'm so proud of you. I think that's one of the key things that we as a quote unquote first world country, like that we as a society that we struggle with. um, I just think it's not something that's very well instilled or uh, exemplified. Um, And it's a big struggle for folks. And there's, there's actually a reason for that. So like, if you think about it, um, you know, from like an evolutionary standpoint, um, you know, our minds were developed to like, um, to want to be connected to other people. Like we were talking about in the beginning of this podcast. Um, and, uh, we will go to very varied amounts of lengths in order to feel connected to somebody and be accepted by somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, because like, you know, back in the, you know, the Stone Age and with, uh, you know, um, our early um, ancestors, right? Um, 
that was a means of survival, right? Like strength in numbers. Um, if I was by myself, I was at a greater likelihood of, of being vulnerable. But if, you know, I can be connected, right, I have a better chance of surviving. But we're not there anymore, right? And I think that we sometimes, our, our, our mind is still programmed um, with those uh, narratives and it sees threats of that. So like if we're not connected to somebody, we, our mind can interpret that as, a, uh, as an attack, as a, um, as a threat uh, to our very survival. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's not helpful. Right. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, also, I, I think that it's important to mention that um, I think that sometimes we uh, we don't give ourselves the opportunity to stand on our stand by ourselves, right? And sometimes we can rely on other people, other groups, other ideas, right, in order to um, provide us comfort. And another part of this process is um, internalizing our values, the things that are important to us so that we can, um, we can have that inner strength in order to, to do the things that are really important to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't know. It, it, to me, this is about like letting people know that there's more. And like, it is a bit of a self journey. Um, And like, you can, the speed and the depth of which you travel is, is yours. And that there's like, there's a sense of comfort and security in that. Like, you don't have to do certain things a certain way at a specific pace at a certain time. Like, I think that that's not message that we get externally, but the reality is like, you can do it um, in your own style, in your own way, in your own time. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's the important thing is to recognize that it's your journey, right? Um, and it's, you know, your quest, right? Um, and, you know, you can do with it as you will. Um, so, uh, I didn't think that it would be right or fair, um, to talk, to give you all this information and not provide you really some information on like, you know, if you are part of the 40% of the population, right. That does have an insecure, um, attachment style. Well, what do I do? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so first go see a therapist, <laughs> right. Um, uh, of course that's something that I advocate for. Um, and, uh, and also to know what, uh, what your pattern is. Um, so I, uh, copy and paste a, a really quick and dirty attachment quiz um, to the resources of this. And it's really good. Um, it's uh, part of a, uh, a project called the Attachment Project um, that provides a lot of resources uh, for people who are wanting to explore their attachment style and, um, and possibly migrate to a more secure attachment. Um, so... You know, so the first, you know, part of this journey is to know which path or which direction you're going, right? We're headed towards security. So um, having that self-awareness of that this is our journey, right? This is our path. Um, and and it's kind of our responsibility to kind of pick up the, the staff and, um, and walk towards... Um, that secure um, behaviors, right? And um, and to know what to do, right? Like, um, what are the uh, what are the beliefs that I have about relationships and myself and relationships, um, and how is that negatively impacting my my patterns, right? right. Um, uh, also, we need to know. Uh, what we need to ask from others that is reasonable and within their control, right? Because I know that sometimes I can ask for things from other people that are just not going to happen, right? Like, tell me everything's going to work out. Sorry, baby, I can't, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but like, hey, tell me that, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, having a conversation about, hey, I'm really feeling anxious right now. Um, you know, can you 
can you hold me, right? Can we, uh, you know, can we have a conversation about that? Um, and when we do get that, uh, you know, from other people, it's really important for us to name that um, and notice that that this is the thing that we're doing in order that is going to take one step towards a secure attachment and to normalize this, right? That 40% of the people in the world um, struggle with this. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is kind of normal. And, you know, this is, this is something that sometimes I got to do um, and remind ourselves um, that, like why having a secure attachment is important, right? Um, why do I want that? Why, why is that important to me? Um, and also sharing appreciation towards others that, uh, that, that they took that action, right? Hey, I really appreciate you having that conversation with me. I really, I really appreciate you calling me uh, when you got home. Um, I really, you know, I really, I really like that. Um, and that will, kind of help help us be more mindful and aware of it in the future so that we can kind of say, hey, you know what? I'm noticing that I'm not feeling as um, anxious, right, in my relationships towards others because of these steps that I've taken. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... That's big. It, it takes time, though, to develop that. Mm -hmm. And again, that goes back to why I was saying, like, be aware of if we start creating our own timetable concepts, because it's it's OK to maybe think that there should be certain goals or milestones or whatever, but be flexible and, you know, don't box yourself in. <laughs> what was that? What was that phrase? Oh, more flex flexibility, flexibility for, more for accessibility. accessibility. Yes. Of it. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the other thing that's really important with this process, right, that we always kind of talk about is communication is key. Um, you know, it's really important for us to um, be able to identify, identify our feelings, um, communicate our thoughts and our feelings honestly and openly with others. Um, and that can be a really, really hard struggle for people. So again, be kind to yourself. Um, and that this isn't, this isn't easy. And sometimes this is a, this is a large task to ask. Um, the other, you know, factor that's uh, impacting this is um, a lot of times we aren't given these tools uh, growing up. Um, so uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's also important to be compassionate towards yourself that like, hey, I'm learning, right? This is a learning process. Um, and I get to, I get to kind of build these tools and use them, but it requires practice, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be good at this from the get go. Yeah, I mean, that's common for all of us. But I think we forget that from time to time. Yeah. Compassion and kindness and forgiveness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, another thing like we've talked about in the past is practicing intimacy and not just sexual intimacy, but um, uh, I think I've said this on this podcast, but there's this uh, wonderful uh, relationship therapist by the name of David Schnarch who passed away a couple of years ago. And he said that intimacy is knowing who you are and letting someone else in on the on the secret. So again, that's an intrapersonal experience that we're, is going to require us to go on this journey of self discovery, um, and we can't uh, we can't expect other people to do that for us. Um, you know, that is something that is really personal uh, and and important for us to do that. Um, and it's going to require us to be, uh, you know, uncomfortable or get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And um, I think that uh, a lot of times, myself included, um, I have this pattern of feeling like everybody needs to know everything about me right away um, uh, or else, you know, kind of like, well, if you don't like this, how about this? <laughs> how about this? 
right? And mm. so, you know, kind of the idea that it's okay to be mysterious, it's okay that everybody doesn't know everything about you. Um, kind of think about it like if I've used this analogy on this club, like the the or this podcast, the uh, the club, right? Like, you know, like there you have different floors uh, for people to explore. Um, you know, the our life can be more than just a one floor kind of deal. Hmm. Interesting. I, I think um, it, it goes to the whole, like, there's a whole world out there, like, beyond, you just may not be able to see that or sense that. Yep, and we're always evolving, we're always changing, and it's important to let people kind of in on that process as well. Um, you know, the, the more that you think um, things are staying the same, the more that they change. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then also, uh, when you notice that other people are practicing intimacy with you, acknowledge and appreciate that. Hey, I just wanted to check in with you. I really appreciated, um, our conversation about your struggles with work. I know that must've been really hard. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here for you, right? Um, it's a two way street. Right. Um, and another one that's really hard for people is independence. Um, you know, accept that you're going to struggle with this, right? If you, if you have uh, struggled with independence or, or autonomy in the past, um, you know, you're not, you're not going to be good at this. So like the thing that I will tell people is to, it's okay to ask questions, right? Um, Google is your friend. Um, and you know, kind of gauge your own willingness about what you're willing to do. And then whatever is outside of that, it's okay to ask for support, right? So like, hey, I'm willing to do this, this, and this, but I'm going to need support on this, this, and this. The important thing is that you're identifying what you, what you can do on your own. Um, and then also like celebrate your success. Um, you know, to those who are close to you, right? This is, this is a journey, right? Like, and it's hard and we need to, uh, you know, recognize when it's, when we just took a really big step. Um, sometimes that's, I got out of bed today, right? Sometimes that's, I took a shower or I, you know, insert thing here. Um, uh, you know, and it's important to kind of tell your supports that. Um, but I think the thing that we sometimes struggle with is we want to broadcast it on a sometimes, uh, you know, large um, platform. And sometimes we don't get the response that we were hoping for. Um, and that can be disappointing. Right. Mm hmm. Um, and then the final thing is just to find secure people, right? Um, like I've said it on here in the past, like something that my mom used to tell me is to um, stick with the winners, right? And I, I don't really necessarily like that language, um, but who do you see as people who are secure? So who are the people who are able to um, honestly and openly communicate their feelings, are able to regulate themselves in, in relationships, right? Who are those people? Stay close to them. Find out what works for them, right? Because they're the anchors that are going to help um, stable you and ground you towards a more secure attachment. Right. Um, and I think that can be a struggle for folks if you don't know who they are um, or you don't know people that well to be able to make that decision or that, like, determination as to who, you know... Um, has secure attachment kind of stuff. So that might take a little while to sort out. Yeah. Um, and that's again, a, a kind of being aware about what is, what are good models for that. Um, and you can look for them uh, because sometimes our idea of what secure attachment might be insecure attachment or, you know, if somebody like for some, also, did you know that a lot of people who are, who have um, anxious insecure attachments 
will um, match up with avoidant attachment. Okay. So like somebody who um, may be anxious could see somebody who's avoidant as a good model of, um, of what they think is secure, but it's actually just kind of the other side of that um, pendulum. Right. I can, I can imagine the complications in that relationship because of their attachment styles. Yep. Yeah. The one is like, uh, you know, you feel too much. Well, you don't feel anything. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I can't imagine that being said in the therapy session. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so, um, so that's that. I mean, I think the, you know, kind of like what I said before, the important things about this is, um, you know, if you want to go on that journey, um, you know, there are quizzes that you could take. There's the one that I put on here that you can take to come in. And it gives you a good readout um, as Early to... On dismissive avoidant. There you go. I'm disorganized. Um, and, um, and then also, you know, I've also put on there the information about like, you know, how we got to where we are as a, you know, a human race, right? Like that, uh, having these attachment, um, issues, quote unquote, um, is kind of normal, um, and to be expected because of how our mind processes, uh, or how our mind has evolved over the years. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a really good Instagram account, the Millennial Therapist, um, that has wonderful um, attachment content. Um, I really appreciate their their work. And then um, some of the the research that I talked about before about um, the integration of like attachment theory and the sexual minority uh, stress model. These have been good resources for folks. Yeah. The uh, the quick attachment quiz I think will be uh, insightful uh, to go through and and see for yourself like what your quote unquote style is I guess. Oh, and for our listeners who are in consensual non monogamy relationships, there's a really great book out there called Poly Secure. Um, which takes the um, attachment uh, theory model and applies it to um, a consensual non-monogamy relationships. Hmm. Nice. And it's available on Audible as well. That's where I'm listening to it. Why people listen so there... to books more than read them today? Which I suppose that means more people are consuming books. I hear that. I've been listening to Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart um, on my drives, um, which is which has been really nice. Mm -hmm. I think people are taking advantage of using technology to allow them to have experiences that they might not have considered before. And the, the mode of that happening, I think is a key piece of it. Like I think about it, I'm like, you know, while driving distracted is not an ideal situation, there's, I think a distinct difference between like, um, you know, engaging in something that isn't focused on the driving versus like listening and then like, taking something in, so to speak. Um, or even if you're not driving, like if you're, you know, using public transit or something, um, mm -hmm. you know, that you can, you can be semi attached to the situation, like observant of the world around you, but also doing something else. Um, I was just, uh, listening to a podcast 
by Adam Grant and Brene Brown and somebody else where they kind of talked about that, but a lot of our productivity comes from having something um, that we are secure with, something that we kind of are familiar with um, that can help us kind of uh, be creative um, because it it feels familiar to us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, um, I, I don't know about you, but like something that um, I do, like if I'm trying to like get a lot of work done is I'll put on like Law and Order SVU or you know, friends reruns, um, something that I don't have to like really be like cognitively focused on. Um, or some of my best ideas happen in the shower. Hmm. I can understand that. I find music is probably the thing that I keep coming back to, especially if I need energy, but I don't really need to be committed. So like just having music going like, kind of gives me like the BPM, so to speak, like kind of keeps me in a certain mode or mood or, or whatever that is. Cause there are several times, like just this past week, I needed to work on something at work and I had to like, just not shut my phone off, but be like, I listen to a lot of podcasts and I'm like, I can't do this. Like I can't have mm. anything going because I really need to focus. And I knew for me, it was very distracting because it was like kind of splitting my time, like paying attention to an interview or a discussion and, I'm like, no, I need to be able to authentically create in this moment and write something. And this is too distracting. Yep. Um, are you familiar with bilateral stimulation music? Mm -mm. So there's a form of music. It, um, it, I guess it's like created in order to stimulate um, both hemispheres of your brain. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's a really good therapeutic tool in order to help process information. Interesting. I know. <laughs> so there we go. So that's um, that's kind of my pitch on attachment. Um, I could literally talk about this for hours. I think it's a, a really wonderful topic. Um, and I think, like I, I said to you, I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. I think I might have created an outline for a potential journal article because of this. Well, and I think if, if there is more to be explored with it, we might revisit it and talk about some things like, you know, um, specifics about, you know, maybe discussing further about these different types of insecure attachment and like how we can um, work with them um, in some ways. Yeah, um, I I oftentimes find uh, a lot of my clients really respond well to that whole club metaphor about the intimacy that like, you know, everybody can't be in the VIP section or everybody can't be on the bottom floor um, because then it's just going to be like way too crowded. Right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's good to have people on the, on the higher levels. Um, and that they know something about you that, like, the people on the first floor don't. That's fair. Yeah. And that's okay. Well, once again, Ed, I think you've given us lots to think about. Mm-hmm. And I Very look forward to... Episode. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot for folks to take away, but also it's important. And the beauty of it is they can listen to it again and again and again and again. And again. <laughs> Watch it again uh -huh. and again and again. Agreed. No. Well, yeah. So if you have any comments about this, what is your chat attachment type? We take that little quiz. You can find all these links. This me trying to go through this with my current situation. This will be fun. If you find ways to contact us, you can go to our website, CubsOutLoud.com, or shoot us an email at CubsOutLoud at gmail.com. Leave us voicemail it's at 361-COL-TALK. That's 361-265-8255. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at CubsOutLoud in the appropriate place of the URL. Or join our Telegram chat at tinyurlcom slash telegram-col. If you would like to know when we plan on recording these shows, 
Uh, you can check it out on our Google Calendar at tinyurl.com slash calendar dash col. And you can get various thermal at our Zazzle store at zazzle.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Uh, some of those designs were designed by Smashy. You can find more of his work at dpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. Or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud or send us a donation at paypal.me slash Cubs Out Loud. Please pop over to your favorite podcasting platform and uh, read us and review us. Puts up uh, us higher in the algorithm. And of course on YouTube, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. So cliche, just have to say it. You can find me anywhere on the internet as box hat, box puppy, box cup, box something or other. Gary. If you want to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GareBear73. Um, I do have a Twitter. Actually, I have several Twitters. But uh, the one I'm usually on the most is GareBear73XXX because I'm a pervert and I like seeing that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and if people want to get in touch with you and discuss this further or ask you for extra um, additional resources or things of that nature, how would they do so? Yeah, sure. So if you don't, um, if you don't follow me or, or if we're not friends on Facebook, feel free to friend me um, as Edward AC on Facebook. Um, I'm also on uh, Instagram as dr dot unicub u i n c u b underscore sex brain wizard. Yes, you heard that right. Um, and both of those, um, or at least the Instagram is, uh, just request me, um, and you know, clients and all. And then uh, I have a Twitter, Eddie H cook, um, that is safe for work. And then all, like Gary, I'm also a pervert. Um, so if you would like to see, um, if you want to follow me on Twitter for the perverts, pervert stuff, <laughs> you can, that's uh, Dr. Unicub after dark. And with that, uh, see you again, everybody. Good night, everybody. Ciao for now.